So this is the part where we like to involve all of you. So the best way to learn version control is by doing. So if you have the ability to log on to the lab machines, I recommend that you do that now. Also, you might notice that we're doing this on a Mac. The git commands are identical. It's a Unix-based kernel, mm -hmm. so it's going to be very similar to what you're doing, if not completely the same. And if you are one of those particular people who like to hate yourself and do git on Windows, it's completely the same commands too. Right. There are many different ways to do it on Windows. If you want to know how, then just ask one of us and we'll pry for a little while and explain how to do it. The first thing that you want to do with, before you start using git for the first time is you want to do some setup stuff. Now you notice the command that I put there, I put a flag, it's dash dash global. What this will do is it will make it really easy. So whenever you want to start a new project, it will use the same settings that you've been using for all of your other Git projects. Now, if you want to set up individual settings, you just do the same command git config without the dash dash global option. So, for example, if we were setting up a new git username configuration for our illustrious president over there, we could say the username is Mr. President. The email is acm at cs.clemson.edu. Yes, a typo. We will fix that. And we would say that his preferred editor is Vim, and he likes colors, because colors are nice. Now, what does the, the colors option do? So by default, for whatever reason, Git assumes that you don't have colors on your terminal, or the abilities to support them. So if you want to turn colors on, on the Git output, you need to set the color.ui preference to true. Just take our word for colors Yes. It's really nice, because um, especially when you're looking at diffs, the old diff formats are kind of obtuse. And we'll explain the diffs later. Yeah. But, so we kind of have, question? So where do we find the global configuration file? Great question. If you were here at our Linux seminar last week, we talked a lot about dot files. So the git global stuff is in tilde slash dot git config, I believe. Yes, it's your home directory dot git config. Um, for example, let's take a peek at mine. Now, Robert is using Z shell, which is why it looks weird. So for example, this, this is my global git config. So I have my username for the source repository that I use most often, which is um, Bitbucket, I have my email, um, I have my push style set to simple because that's just a personal preference, um, UI equals true, and editor vim. So just to kind of give you an idea, this is what the global git file looks like. So there's two different ways to start a project. So we can either do git init, which is how we start new projects. This creates a new repository in the current location. Whereas git clone is used to start working with a previously existing repository. Now it's a little bit fun. Um, git clone normally clones into a new folder. You can specify the name of it if you want. Git init turns the current folder into a repository. Yeah. So we're going to assume that you're working on a new project today for most of our examples. So let's kind of talk about how that works. So first we want to make a new directory for the project we're going to work on. And let's call this ACM. So we're going to change into ACM and call git init. And we get this nice little message that says initialized empty git repository in users Robert Underwood acm.git. Now your terminal won't have this nice little indicator that says you're on the branch master. And we'll explain those words in a second. But his does. And you can have it too if you investigate Z shell. Yes. And actually, the newest version of Bash also has it. Now that we've initialized our repository, we can start doing normal things. So let's start by adding some files. So Why don't you just go with the cap, all caps readme? Um, GitHub projects, especially. For, like, it's a very common thing to have a readme file, and the format of the name for that is just all caps, the word readme. You might see that pretty often. Okay. 
So we have a readme file, so we could say this is a test um, item one, item two, item three. Okay? So let's say that's what we have in, as our initial readme. Um, so. Well, I was getting ready to flip back. Oh. So, currently, if you ever want to see the status of your current project, you can do git status. Okay. So it says we're on branch master. It's telling us we're at our initial commit. So in other words, we haven't made any commits yet to the repository. And it tells us that we currently have an untracked file called readme.markdown. So, if we want to add that file to version control, it's pretty easy. Git add readme. What is the dot markdown extension? Um, markdown is a format that's really useful. It's used on both GitHub and Bitbucket for readmes because they want to protect themselves from HTML, JavaScript, and other such exploits. It's a really handy, lightweight markup language. So if you want to take some notes and add some syntactic meaning to different elements of the text, like for example, we had a header and some itemized list items in the readme that we had, Markdown's really useful for that. It's basically a standardized way of writing text files, and people have turned it, have made it so that you can render it in HTML and other stuff. It's really easy if you're looking for something lightweight and you don't want to go full bore with HTML or XML or one of the other different markup languages. So notice we've now done git add readme.markdown. So we can do a git status again. And now it says we have a new file, readme.markdown. Do we have any? That's all hand back there. Do you have a question? Okay. So at this point, we want to do a git commit. So we want to save this initial version of our readme file. So we can do git commit. It opens it up in our text editor of choice, in my case, Vim. First version of the project. So when you type git commit, you are given a prompt to add a message along with the commit that explains maybe what the commit contains or why you did what you did in it. Um, they're generally pretty short. You can make them long if you want people to hate you. And the messages will show up in the git log. Which we'll go over in just a second. So one other thing I want to point out here is whenever you're typing up your commit messages, the first line needs to be less than 70 characters because on most terminals it gets truncated if you don't. Um, so first line is 70 characters, and then you can have your additional commit lines. So the first line is a one-line summary, what is this project, why do I care, or what happened in this commit, why do I care kind of thing. So for example, this is the first version of the project. And what we did is we added a readme. Now, strictly speaking, this might not be the best commit message because we don't necessarily want to keep track of things like version numbers. That's why we're using a version control system. It's commonplace to call the very first commit containing the initial stuff like uh, boilerplate readme or some of the other um, plumbing files right? that's called initial commit. So, so you don't have to do that. So anyways, boilerplate added. And when we close our text editor, it'll say that we added a new commit. It's the root commit. It tells us the commit that gives us back the commit message and tells us what file we had and how many changes we had. So if we made some additions, and this time we did six insertions, but if you had some things where you took out some code, like let's say we dropped item two, it'll show us that we had some lines removed. And we'll show you how that works in just a second. You also see this line here create mode, some numbers, followed by the file. That's not as important unless you really want to get into what's called the plumbing of Git, the technical backend commands that you can use. But essentially, just suffice it to say, since it says create mode, we created a new file. So now we want to find out what happened. So we can do a git log, and we see commit this obnoxiously long hash. Who did it? 
what their name is, what time they did it, and then we see the text of the commit. Now, this really long, unfortunate looking number is a SHA-1 hash. I don't know what it's sourced from. It's, it's based off the hash of all of the files. Okay. Um, SHA-1 is not a cryptographically secure hashing mechanism, but it is very good for identification and avoiding collisions. Um, it's very, very, very unlikely that any two commits are going to have the same hash. So it's just, the hash is just a way to identify an individual commit because once you get into having a very complicated tree, which you might unfortunately, it's very handy to be able to say, I want the commit that's this number. Now you don't have to type out the whole thing. You can just type like the six, the first eight characters or something. Yeah, it's the first eight characters. But that's what it's for. So, let's say that we then edited the readme file, and let's say we didn't want item 2 anymore, and then we wanted to add item 4, and we wanted to change this to a level 1 header. Which is a thing in Markdown. Uh, just for clarity's sake, we wanted to change that to hyphens because we're a CD. Yeah. So Austin yelled at me about my bad coding style, so we changed it. Yeah. So notice again that my status indicator has changed. So let's check good status and see what happened. So it says we're on branch master. There are no changes currently staged for commit, but we have a modified readme.markdown. So if we want to see what changed between the two versions, we can do a git diff. And it shows that we subtracted out this line right here added in this line, took out this item, and added in this item. Um, this is where setting that color thing was important, um, because by setting the color, we get red for all the stuff that was taken out and green for all the stuff that was added. It's really nice, makes it much quicker to identify what changes were exactly made to a file. Now, what are the turquoise numbers? Ah, the turquoise numbers. That tells you roughly what lines of the files the context of the diff comes from. Um, Git's actually pretty intelligent about only showing you the stuff that changed and then just a little bit more so you know roughly where it fits in the grand scheme of things. Um, for example, if we had some obnoxiously long program like a ray tracer that we were trying to keep track of, um, if we changed, let's say we just changed a pixel T to a um, image T, well, that's not going to make any sense if we don't know what file it is or roughly where in that file it is. So that's kind of what the turquoise numbers would indicate. So we have another command that we can kind of do here is we're going to git commit again. And you can also add your commit message like this with passing the dash m flag. So in this time, Anything. what? We need to add the changes first. Oh, yes, that's right. So, so, A stands for all changes, M stands for message. The fun little thing about the A flag, there, there are two interesting flags here that we'll explain. The A flag means that you want Git to take all of the files that you have told it to watch and commit their changes. The M1 means I want, you want to specify the message here on the command line. So Does that for, make sense? Any questions? So we do git commit am. So this time you notice it says one file change, two insertions, two deletions. Um, and then we can have our handy little comment that says changes suggested by Austin. Now we have, I think we might have covered this in the link somewhere, I'm not totally sure. But you want to make sure that the order is a and then, then m. Because m takes an argument. Um, if you try to go with m a, it would take a as the argument. I believe so, yeah. If you can combine flags like that, but only if you use ones that have an argument at the end. So now, again, we have changes suggested by Austin being the second commit, and then we have that. So it's going to show the newest commits up towards the top. Um, another thing that you can do here is git log has this really nice flag, dash dash stat. And that tells you what files are changed and gives you a nice little graphic indication to give you a rough idea of what kinds of changes were made to those files. 
So if you want to find out kind of big scale what was changed in a commit, the dash dash stat is a great way to do that. Um, also, let's say you had something where you wanted to figure out who made a change. This you, is assuming way down the line when the readme has gone through countless iterations by edits by many different people, and there are a couple of silly little messages in there. You want to find out who it was so you can fire them or commit them. So um, you notice it gives you the SHA hash for when that line is edited, and then it follows it by the next line, and then what Shaw hash was there. It tells you who edited it. For example, if Austin was also committing it to this at the same time, we would also see Austin's little projector ninja mm -hmm. username showing up all throughout these logs. So if you need to find out what changes were made, you can do that. For example, if you try this locally, it'll be a lot more readable than this rap thing. Yeah, that's mostly because my terminal's been blown up to Kingdom Come, so you guys in the back can read it. Um, also, if you're using some tools that we'll talk about later, it can be a lot more readable. But if you need to find out who did something, get blame is a great way to assign that blame. So there's also something called get ref log. Now we're going to kind of talk about what ref log is, but um, in my experience using git, I haven't had to use it very often. It's useful for tracking where People, where you were working last. Right. You probably won't have to deal with it unless something awful has happened and you need to do some black magic to get your code back. But in, that, in the case of that happening, look up git ref, ref log. So, for example, this shows us where our quote head state was previously. So we see our, I was most recently at this commit where I made the changes to by Austin, but previously, one time ago, I was there. You can also, there are flags for git ref log that lets you look for things like um, when the change was made. So if you want to see all of the changes made up from last week, um, you can do time and date filtering on the ref log. So it's a useful thing to have if you need to kind of figure out where you were a week ago. Okay. Now, let's say that we made some mistakes. So let's say we're editing our readme. And let's say we added foobar to our list of items. But eh, let's say we weren't quite happy with that and we want to get back to where we were. We can use the git checkout with the dash dash modifier, add a space, and then you can pass it readme, that markdown, and it will unstage the changes. Now what is the stage, Robert? Tell us about that. Okay, so whenever you add a file, there, so basically you have kind of this amount of changes that you've been making since the last commit, and you're gonna doubt anyone see that. So you have these, yeah, it's completely unreadable. So you have this kind of stage of the last commit, and then you're kind of building things up from there and you're making your little modifications and so on and so forth. So this is, think of it as like a staged, it's ready, getting ready to commit. In so the same thing, you might run into trouble at some point. When you use git add on something and add it to the staging area, as we just explained, it's, the thing that is staged for the commit is the version as it was when you typed git add. So if you use git add on something, and then make a few more changes, and then do commit, it'll commit what you had before, and it's not what you just changed. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, typing git add doesn't just mark the file for commit later. It's commit as it is. So for example, if we did git add on readme right now, we do a git diff. All it's going to show us is test 2. It's not going to mark this as a test to the list of things that we changed because strictly speaking it's not, it's based off whatever we're currently adding. So since we added things last, test 2 is the only thing that shows up. 
again, we can use git. So you added a file that's already in the repo? Yes. Oh, we didn't clarify that. All right. So git add is, uh, it does two different things. It, it can add a new file to be tracked and tell git, tell git that you want to watch that file. But it also uh, sets up like stages, changes to any given file for the next commit. So it provides both those functions. So if we do git add again. Yes. Before every commit, you add the file. Right. That might seem inconvenient at first, but it's so that you can, the, the reasoning behind um, manually setting up what you want to be as a part of every individual commit means that you can section off certain lumps of changes into commits that make sense. Otherwise, every time you hit git commit, you'd be adding every single change in the source code. So add is for saying, I, all right, I want to add this stuff. Yeah. But it's also for adding a new file contract. So could you go back like four commits? Yeah. Yeah, and we'll go into that in just a second. Go how, back however long you want. Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a second. I wanted to point out, I'm showing you the git status right now after we have, we've added it once, but we haven't added our second set of changes. Notice that it shows both readme.markdown as both staged and as unstaged. This is how you can tell if something has changes that have been made that have been added and still some changes that are not added to the current commit. So if you see files in both places, you know that you have some changes that you've made, but you haven't decided to commit at this point. So, I guess we'll go ahead and git commit at this point. Now, if you do a commit, as Robert is doing, with changes, like with something in the staging area, which is that green part up there, and something that is not, just very modified like this is, then it'll commit to the thing that has been staged. And then the modified stuff will remain modified. So for example, if we look at readme.markdown right now, or if we do a git diff right now, we'll see that test2 is still marked as an addition to our previous commit history. So if we want to then add that change, we can then add the changes again. And if you want to see what you're changing since your last commit, you can do this capital H E A D head. And so that explain exactly what head is once we get the branches. But what that basically lets us do is say, show me everything since I last committed. So in this case test two is the new thing. So we can get add readme.markdown again. Okay, I already added it, excuse me. So then we can do another git commit. Question in the back. Um, can you do a diff on what's um, in the stage area and on stage area? Yeah. Yes. So, do you know the syntax? I don't. Okay, so if you do a git diff, yeah. So currently we have two things, or we have a change currently staged, um, which is the test2 item that we talked about earlier. So notice if I do git diff, it's going to just show me what things I've directly changed. Where if I say git diff head, it will show me all of the things that are currently in the staging area. All of the changes made since the staging area. Now, there's a cached option too, right? Yeah. That um, one is more direct, isn't it? There's also a command that will let you see exactly what you've changed since you've added stuff. Um, however, I'm not remembering that particular command no. off the top of my head. So, um, for now, does using git diff head explain? Okay, cool. So again, we're gonna do a git commit of added test two. Okay. Now, if if ever you are worried about the extens extensiveness of your commit messages, everyone has that problem about it. It might just eventually come down to get commit. Blah, blah, blah. 
that happens. Yeah. So uh, the other thing you may notice is we're adding files and committing files relatively rapidly. Um, that is not just because we're doing a quick presentation. You should commit early and commit often. That way you can have lots of different points at which you can easily go back to in your history. And naturally you're going to want to commit at reasonable places, like when you've implemented a function or started out with a good layout, it kind of encourages you to make goals, little tiny ones, while you're coding something, rather than just start from nothing and just go. Which can be very satisfying, but sometimes it doesn't work so well. When, you try and, when you're trying to compile, it ends up with five errors, or 50. Yeah. So, the next commandment we want to talk about a little bit is git revert. So let's say they were like, oh my gosh, we committed way too many things way too early. We need to go back. So let's say that we want to go back to the initial changes suggested by Austin. We can do a git revert part of the hash. Okay. So it says that there are some conflicts with the current revert. Um, that is because we both change lines in our current set of changes and that. So basically, we have to do a merge conflict. This is a lot earlier than I was planning on doing that. Can't you just do show off uh, git reset head first? Yeah. So we talked about. Um, yeah. So we talked about checkout as a way to go back to a specific commit. Like if you want to just jump back and look at changes or the current state of the code at a certain point. Git revert, what that does, this would be really helpful. Uh, this one kind of goes. Awesome. So if we imagine our commits as kind of circles, can everybody kind of see that? Not really. So let's say this one was bad, and we want to go back. If we do get revert, it leaves this change in place, but then brings this version forward. Okay. Yeah, can you turn the light on for just a second? Okay, can you see that any better now? Okay. So we had like a series of commits. Git revert allows us to go back to an arbitrary version and then move it to the top of the current commit history. What this does for us is basically allows us to keep track of, go back to any arbitrary version, but not destroy this history of commits that we have. Um, whereas if you use git reset, git reset can actually be destructive. So it's going to completely go at this point, lop off everything, and get rid of it. That's what he just did to fix some things. Yeah. Now you notice that I did git reset, git reset head dash dash hard. What that does is it takes us to the whatever the current head state is, wiping away all changes. Don't ask me any questions. This is the only form of git reset that I would recommend using because it gets you back to whatever your last commit is. It makes sure you're clean and it leaves nothing to be. And it is the only one which is potentially non-destructive. So you're only modifying your local repository. You're not making changes which are getting pushed to a larger repository. So you're not destroying any of the history that you would be developing with a project. Now, Robert is kind of crazy about all that. So read up on yourself and decide if it's better or not, right? Yeah, because Austin, for whatever reason, seems to like that command. Sure. I like being destructive. Let me interrupt for a second. Who is having trouble following this? Hey, not bad. Great. I had to read the Git book about five times before I started to understand how it worked. So don't feel bad if it's really weird to follow. It's a bizarre concept to get used to, especially all this talk about ordering resets and branches. Question. Uh, do you have any like recommended reading like that book? We'll yes, get to that at the end. At the very end, we're going to point out some resources. Um, the one I mentioned is ProGit by, I think, one of the people who worked on it, maybe? Yeah. It's officially recommended by the website. So we'll get to that, don't worry. Okay. So we've kind of talked about 
the concept of a branch. So what a branch is, is basically, think of it as a set of related versions. So for example, we've been talking a lot about master. Master is just a branch. But branches don't have to be just like that. You could also have, um, so you can also have some crazy idea that you want to try out. But you want to make sure that you leave the rest of your normal code in good working order. That's what Git branch is designed to help you do. So it's great for trying new things, building out new features, fixing bugs, while leaving the rest of the code relatively untouched. And then when you're done with it, you either toss it or you merge it into your current state of development. We've also talked a lot about master. Now, for the arbitrary, the, um, I guess, it, what is it, obligated Lord of the Rings reference, it's um, one branch to rule them all, one, right. one branch to find them, one branch to bring them yes, all in, in the darkness, bind them. Wrong gates here, we get it. Okay. We can recite that, right, guys? <laughs> So what, get, what master is, is it's supposed to be your stable, your final product. It's what you want to present to the world. If someone's coming to your project, master should be there, ready for them to go, clean and in a very well-organized manner, working, no bugs, no compile errors. It should be ready to go. Now this is an ideal, so don't worry about it. Yeah, so if you're not quite there your first couple of times, or if you're the only person who ever might possibly work on your particular repo or project, then feel free to commit on master as we've been doing so far. Um, master is the branch created when you do your git init. It's the branch. It's a long running branch. It's going to keep basically the bulk of your project. Um, as I said, try not to make changes directly here because, well, when you break something, well, then master's screwed up and then what per people's first impressions of your code are are then screwed up and causes lots of problems. Likewise, always test your changes going into master. Again, this is one of those ideals Austin was talking about. You want to try and make sure that mas this is trying to keep master as a, quote, clean branch, a branch that where stuff works. Now let's actually talk about these branches. Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Um, we didn't actually talk about the technical details of what makes up a branch. Because a the idea of a bunch of related commits makes sense if you're thinking about it, but how it's implemented might make a little bit more sense to some of you like it did for me. I'm going to flip on the lights for a second. I'm sorry. So I'll, t I'll keep this quick. Basically, a branch just is a pointer to a commit. Um, that's, what, that's what I meant when I said we'll get to the head when I talk about branches. So if you have a bunch of commits, or three in this case, maybe even four. This one is where you start, it's the initial. This one, and then this one. We can say that the master branch is currently pointing right here. But this other one, this commit, is where you made a branch from this commit and did something else. So you might have gone back and messed with master and stuff, but you, you'll have a branch that's right here. We'll call it B. And then manipulating those pointers is fantastically simple, and it's what part of what makes Git branching Git really a big deal because people like how easy it is to mess with branches. You can very easily create a new one or move them around or delete old ones, and it won't involve making a complete copy of the code base like certain other version control systems do. Now the thing about head, we are talking about it as it's kind of, it references what you're working on right now, and head is actually just a pointer to what you're working on. It's a, kind of like a branch. It's not quite, it's a little different, but if you're working on master at the moment, then you'll have the head which points to master then what if you want to work on this step again? It's very easy, I think we'll get to some... We're getting ready to do yeah. it. It's very easy to just move that so that it points back here, and you can work on this branch. Any questions? Does that make some sense? Good, I see half knots, that way it goes. So whenever you want to make a new branch, the easiest way to do it is with the git checkout command with the dash b. 
Um, you can use git checkout to check out any arbitrary commit, but in this case, this case, we're going to create a new branch and we're going to call it crazy idea. Okay. Okay. So we've created a new branch called crazy idea. Notice that my current status has changed to crazy idea instead of master. And if we do a git status, we see that we now are on crazy idea. So we can edit the markdown. Okay, and then we can commit. Oop, got to add it first. Now, some of you may notice that Robert is somehow very quickly typing out the remainder of readme that markdown. If any of you are not familiar with tab completion, please raise your hand. All right, you all know that. Okay, you are not. Okay, cool. So tab completion is this really cool thing that is a feature in most command line shells, except Windows, because Windows is terrible. What it means is that when you're typing out usually a file name, some other shells have completion for other stuff. Like, in this case, if you're typing readme, then you could press tab, and it would fill it in with the file that is local to that folder. It's really awesome. And it speeds up things a lot, and it makes you avoid typos, which a lot of us have trouble with, especially me. That's all about typing. So, as I said, we've created a new thing. If we get a look at the git log, we see that we started some crazy project. And then let's say we want to go back to master. So we do git checkout master, and we're back at master. Then we can make some changes. And check out the log. Oh, yeah. I'm going to do that in just a second. Okay. All right. Git log. Let's do that now. So notice in this version of the log, we don't have that we've started some crazy project. Things just kind of moved on. So instead, let's go ahead and have it's just some arbitrary changes. Okay. I will remember at some point. Yeah, I no. Okay. So now let's go back work on the crazy idea again. Get check out crazy idea. If you're using bash, you don't have that feature um, where you can tab complete branches. But so we went back to crazy idea. And let's say at this point we want to move crazy idea into master. Or more specifically, we want to take this, the, all the new cool crazy stuff that we added in Crazy Idea because it's so crazy and awesome. We want to put it in the master branch. So and merge the two things. Yeah. So a quick question. Sure. If you were in one branch, you started to change a file, but you didn't um, add it to the stage, and then you switched to another branch, would anything happen to those changes? It will help you before you yeah. change. Okay. We'll say do something. Some solutions are either committing it, um, ditching it, or stashing it, which I think we'll be, addre we'll be addressing in a minute. Okay. Yeah, so let's say we did something. Notice it kind of yelled at me when I tried to check out master again after editing the read. So now we can go back over to master, and we can do a git merge of crazy idea. What did you just do with the git checkout from dash? All right, um, we did that a minute ago. Can anyone tell me what the git checkout dash dash file does? You just got rid of those extra changes, right? Yes, and basically what it means is that the checkout, it's, it's another one of those kind of multi-purpose functions. That's what a lot of the functions in Git are for. But it specifically asks Git to 
go and grab what it had stored for readme.markdown and just replace what you have right now with that. Um, the dash dash is actually a terminal thing, which means that it's separating the commands from the arguments, or from the input arguments, rather. It's a very awkward set of symbols that you have to use sometimes with functions, especially like git, that can just take an arbitrary number of command, like extra commands sometimes. But that's what it's doing. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so is everybody ready for some merging magic? So we're going to go ahead and merge. So Git has now told us that we've made a merge by a recursive strategy. Now what this means is if we look at README right now, we see both the new stuff from master, but also the this is absolutely crazy stuff from our crazy project. So this is really nice because what it lets us do is it lets us easily combine code from a bunch of different places. So. Now, does it matter where you run the command from? Like if, it, if I'm in master and run merge, is it different from if I'm in new stuff and, add, and run merge? So you should always run merge from where you want to merge to. So if you want to merge crazy idea into master, you go on to master and then merge crazy idea. So if you are on branch foobar and you want to move to master, you check out master and merge foobar. If you want to merge crazy idea into foobar, you check out foobar and then get merge crazy idea. And what are the repercussions of doing it wrong? Well, one, it kind of makes your commit history a little bit funky. Um, um, it's really funky in some cases. Um, we don't like funky. Yeah. And in some cases, it can kind of be a pain because um, occasionally, yes. You can also merge master into your branch. Yes, but that's not considered good practice. But that's a Robert problem, right? Yeah. Really, you want to do your own research on it. See what the people in Stack Overflow think. <laughs> what they say is right. Right. Okay. I mean, you can you can really do anything you want. Master is just a branch, but. It's a nice branch. You want to keep it clean. Yes. So. Like, if you wanted to merge master into your current branch, you should probably branch master and then merge those two branches. Well, here, here's a situation where you might want to merge master into some other branch. Let's say you've been working on a project for a long time, but let's say you had some new changes that were just recently pushed to master. Um, because someone just was doing development right on top of master, whether or not they should have been. And they've been going along, and let's say you need XYZ new feature. At that point, you would then merge master into your side branch. So, And then you can continue working on your stuff, bringing, and allowing you to bring in the changes that that person made to master earlier. And then, later on, you can then merge master, in, or move your crazy branch changes into master. Does that make any sense? Question. Will you be able to see the older versions of Crazy Idea after it's merged, or is it gone once it's merged? Great question. So, by default, Git holds on to everything. Until everything. You, everything. It's, all, it's really hard to get rid of something once you've committed it at least once. Like, really hard. Yeah. Like, really, really hard. You, like, have, to, you have to pretty much eliminate all references to it and then wait for like a month. Yeah, because it's still in the reference log until the reference log hits like 100 commits or something, something like that. So it's really hard to get rid of something. So if you try hard enough and you do some black magic with ref log, you can probably get it back. So, But that's not really important for what your question was. You just asked about the history of that branch. Um, in fact, the brand, the, that branch will remain pointing to where it was before, right? Or will it get moved up? Um, it will continue pointing at wherever it's pointing. Okay. So whatever, you know how we said you check out master and then you merge master, merge the other branch into master? The other branch will stay where it's at. So crazy idea will stay at the state that crazy idea was right. before and we merged it into master. Continue adding new things to crazy idea and then merge those new things into master later. That's what a lot of people do with... Uh, kind of typical git workflow of having like a feature branch next to their master branch. 
every once in a while after they've added a bunch of new features, they'll merge those into master and then keep working on the new stuff from the features, but keep master at where it was, just stable. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. cool. Question yes. in the front. So all this is local to your machine. Yes. yes, we're getting ready to talk about when it's not local. So there are two people that you've probably heard of. There's this little company called GitHub. Pretty small. Yeah, pretty small, not very important. I I'm just kidding. What they do is they host a Git repository. So remember how we talked about how Git was distributed, where every person kind of has a local copy of their repository? Well, strictly speaking, if I had a line going from my computer to Austin's and our computers could talk to each other, I could literally send my changes over to Austin and then pull them directly back over. There's nothing significant about the fact that my machine was the initial machine where the stuff was created on, and Austin was the one who eventually took the changes. So there's a couple things that we would want to talk about with regard to Bitbucket and GitHub. Um, both of them, if you create, account, create an account with your .edu email address, so for example, um, robertu at clemson.edu or something of that sort, you get free code hosting. Thank you, Daniel, for showing me that last year. Now to be specific, you GitHub is free public repositories, as many as you want, which is great if you're into open source. Not so great if you're working on a class project that you shouldn't be sharing, because your professor will probably hate you. Uh, their free hosting, specifically for EDU addresses, is Bit, no, GitHub is up to five private repositories that only you can see and share with other people. Bitbucket is infinite free private repositories if you give them a .edu address. Now, an important distinction is that you don't have to sign up initially with a .edu address. As long as you add one on there later, they'll tell you, hey, you're, uh, you're eligible. Sort of. So don't worry about doing it right the first time. You can add a bunch of different email addresses. That's, what, that's all the information I think about those. Yes? Also, Bitbucket doesn't discriminate if anyone remembers C plus equality. Uh, I don't remember that. Um, it was a big ordeal about uh, GitHub taking down a project, or they wouldn't allow it to be hosted because they didn't agree with it. So, was that the was that the one like the the feminist sequel? That was really silly, though. Come on. I mean, it was. It was obviously it's still, just it's still funny that designed to stir up trouble. Out. I don't know. So, anyways, um, <laughs> on another note. If you are uber paranoid, it's actually pretty easy to set up your own Git server. That is way beyond the scope of what we're going to be talking about today. If you want to know, check out the books that we're going to recommend at the end. Um, so with Git, we talk about remotes. For example, I can have a remote to talk to Austin's machine. So let's say I know that Austin's machine is at 192.168.0.1. There's no place like home. So I can add the address. One night, I can add, I can do a git remote add origin and then give it the address 192.168.0.1. And then every time I push to Austin, Austin will then get my new code. Um, push is the command that you use to push stuff to someone else. In other words, give someone else something and pull, or, and then you can just use git put, or we notice that we put a dash u for my branch there's also a typo here this should be git push dash u origin my new branch uh, so basically at that point I'm saying I want to push all of my code to Austin and I want to save Austin as the default place to push this code now you can name remotes whatever you want but origin is the default name for the remote that is automatically set up when you clone a repository from someone so if you're working on GitHub or Bitbucket or something, then if you clone from there, there will automatically be this origin remote of the remote repository. Get a remote, it's not easy. Yes. Um, and then you just do a git push every time after that. However, we should take this time to note that sharing is not always caring, despite, is. despite what the Care Bears say. Um, some things should not be shared. Um, private information, um, your um, personal SSH private key it's, should not be shared, uh, any API keys that you have, 
um, your passwords to your Wi-Fi router in plain text or not in plain text for that matter. Um, anything that may be developer specific, for example, API keys, if you're using some sort of connection with a Google service, for example, each developer has their own API key. Um, Basically, we're trying to say, don't put anything really valuable into the version control. It's probably not a, bad, not a good idea. If you want it, because remember what we said, it's really hard to get it out once it's there. Especially if you push it to GitHub. It's yeah. almost always going to be there forever. Unless you do some hacky stuff. And even if you do do some hacky stuff, it's probably still going to be there for a long time. Um, other things that you might not want to put in there would be anything that you would call a binary file. For example, if you have a PDF that you're executable. Um, dot slash a dot out for those C++ people out there, um, or C people for that matter. Now, that, the binary stuff also doesn't just apply to the remote related repositories. In general, it's probably not the best idea to commit these binaries because they're going to change so often and the change is going to be catastrophic. There's going to be a lot of changes. Generally, you want the, the binaries to be like the output. Um, if you are, you can probably safely push like libraries that happen to be binary, but you don't want to keep pushing like all the output of what you're working on unless you really want to keep a history of that. Yeah. So one thing that you can do is you can use what's called a dot get ignore file. So in any directory that you want to ignore something, let's say you're working on a C++ project, and we want to ignore all examples of um, dot, a dot out. We can create a text file called dot get ignore in the directory, put the text a dot out in the file, and then Git will automatically ignore any changes made to a dot out. It, it won't even tell you that that is a file that's being untracked. That's there untracked. It'll stop complaining. It's great. Yes. If you want silence, dot get ignore. Um, now you can use patterns in it that get ignored. Can you show some of them? Yeah. So let's say So let's say we wanted to ignore all dot o files. That's how we could do that. If we want to ignore a dot out, we could do that. Um, if we want to ignore all let's say we don't like Python, ignore all Python files. Generally, you won't have to do anything more complicated than the just match everything, the asterisk. But if you do, I'd recommend looking up all the stuff you can do. It was quite a bit, I think. Do you know if it does regular expressions? I hope it does some, okay. but not very much. Generally, all you need to do is just list the stuff you don't want. It shouldn't be too bad. You do, it is generally recommended as good practice to version control the getting more file. Yes. Um, so now let's create a new file test.py. Um, and let's have it. Do a quick one liner to do the C of Aristosthenes. Yes. So let's import this. Notice it still shows that we're in a clean status. If we do a git status, it doesn't list that we've created this file. Even though, if we look at our files list, we see that we have test.py there. And we can even run it. Yes, there was the Zen of Python for two seconds. So, git ignore files are great for those kinds of things. There's also a core.excludes file, which is an option you can set in your global git config file. And that lets you ignore everything for all of your projects by default. For example, let's say you have a, um, let's say you don't particularly like to keep track of assembly files, so you don't want anything with a .s, but then you all of a sudden decide that you're taking uh, CPSC 231 and you need to keep track of your .s files now because you're coding an assembly, well, that's how, that's where that can be useful. You can also add files that are in your .gitignore it's just going to complain. Yeah. You can commit entire directories that don't work. Yeah. Yeah, right? You can just say add this directory. And you're good. Yes, and it will add all children of that directory yeah. by default that are not in your .gitignore right. file. 
ultimately it works on files, but it's it, it is convenient sometimes to say I want this whole folder. Yeah. Um, notice when we tried to add test.py, it allows us to do so. Or it didn't do it this time, but if we wanted to really add test.py for whatever reason, we could add a dash f flag on git add, and then it will add it for us. So, unfortunately, merge magic isn't always perfect. So this Sometimes is... Sometimes it's black magic. Yeah. Get your hands dirty. Yeah, and it's really kind of a pain. At that point, you would want to use a merge merge tool to do that. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to bring up a diff. Um, I think by default it uses Emacs for whatever reason as your default merge tool. At least that's been my experience. Have you had any other experience, sir? Me? Yes, you. I haven't used merge tool. Okay. Um, there are really fantastic graphical merge tools. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, basically what happens is whenever you have a merge conflict, let's create one real fast. Just make a conflict. Yeah. Uh, Generally, conflicts pop up when you try to change. Well, you try to add changes that are involving this, like the same part of the file. Like you should have two branches, each with its own version of a function. Um, it is changes from when you were split off. So it's like something you added in each branch separately that are around the same point. It'll probably make a bit more sense once we get this going. But when they do crop up, sometimes they're not too bad, sometimes they're a lot of work. Well, he's getting that going. Does anyone have any more questions? At the beginning, we have to have a getting profile in every directory. You want to have Just the top level directory. I, I, there might be ways, actually, to have different ones for no, it's just a top of it, sorry. Um, you can specify different directory things. I okay. I'm not very familiar with it because most of my projects are just one directory deep or something. But uh, there might be ways to have more than one if you want to. Generally, it's just you have the one. Ignore us all the one. So we're going to do a git merge of. Can you show off the, what the current brand stuff is? I hadn't done it yet. Oh, okay. So, it says, oh, auto merging readme.markdown. There was a conflict. It exists between the two ones. Automatic merge fails. Fix the conflicts and then commit the result. So, we can do a git merge tool if we want to bring it up. Oop. Apparently, I have a file merge tool. I didn't know I had that on this machine. So, what you can do is let's say we want this version now what is the conflict that it's referencing it's referencing now versus later at the very top of the file okay i didn't catch that yeah um i did not mean don't save so whatever program you may be working on may have different ones i was using osx so it yeah there we go so if we want to do instead vim readme, I'm going to use a, excuse me. So notice it's added these head and these things where it says head and it's a crazy idea. It's a bunch of carrots. That's what you're looking for with the merge resolution. So you can either manually do it or there are tools available, like we talked about the merge tool. Um, so let's say we want to test now. So we delete that, delete that, delete that. Basically, when you are given a merge to deal or a merge conflict to deal with, it'll first give you the version of that part that is from one of the files. Then it'll have those funky delimiters with a bunch of equal signs or arrows or whatever. And then it'll have the other version. And your task is to do something that you're happy with and take out those extra symbols, then commit the result and say, this is what I want as a result of this merge. Yeah. And then it's also going to create a .orridge file for the original file, whatever it was on the branch, in this case, the master version. You can just delete that when you're done. Is it that by default? 
I believe it does, but I'm not entirely certain. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So it's now been resolved. We get look at the git log, merge conflict resolved. So at that point, we can head back over here. So occasionally, you're going to need more power. Git is there to help you. Um, some hosts like GitHub and Bitbucket provide wikis and issue trackers, which are really powerful tools to kind of keep track of a project, especially if you're working with a large group of people. Um, and pull requests, which is another thing generally handled through your GUI, are a great way to ensure that code gets reviewed before it get merged, gets merged into master. The concept of a pull request was, I believe, first started by GitHub. Is that right? That sounds right. Right. So what a pull request is, is do you remember how in the beginning of this lecture I mentioned that you can go like, to GitHub and look at someone else's repository and say, I want to improve this. And you go make your own version of the repository, make your changes. And then after that, how do you get your code back into their version? I mean, you might not do that for a class project or something, but in an open source environment where the objective is to be have the best stuff at the very end, then you want to share your stuff, your changes, and make sure everyone else gets them too. So you'd submit what's called a pull request containing a list of commits that you want to be applied to their version of the code. And most hosts will say, they'll add like a issue tracking to that, they'll have commenting and discussion, all sorts of stuff. And then the owner of the repository will ultimately be able to apply or approve and apply that change or reject it and tell you to go do something else, like change your indentation style because they don't like that or something like that. Question in the back. Does it make sense to think of uh, you're requesting that the owner of the repository pull from your code? Yes. I got that confused with yes, like, clone and pull because it makes me think I'm pulling from them. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. That's yeah. what it explained, actually. Um, Git also provides hooks for doing automated tasks. Like let's say, for example, before you commit code to your branch, you want to run all of your unit test cases, or you have some test cases that you want to make sure work, and or you want to make sure that the code compiles before you commit it to the tree. Git has what are called commit hooks and other pre-commit hooks and lots of hooks, which are basically ways that allow you to execute code whenever you do certain things in Git and certain things happen in Git. We won't get into them. I personally have not had a real need to work on it because I do my testing before committing, but there are really useful things if you get into other types of projects. Yeah. So uh, they're covered in the, one of the books we'll be referencing at the end. Yeah. Um, you can also create your own commands with Git plumbing. Um, Git provides lots of raw power available. So one thing that you can do is if you have a specific kind of arbitrary random task that gets porcelain commands, That's our, those are like the add, the checkout that we talked about earlier. Another good example is one of my favorite Stack Overflow questions provided this really super long command that spits out a beautiful colorized ASCII graph of what you've been working on and all of the different branches and everything. It's lovely. Uh, it's probably one of the first results in Stack Overflow if you want to go look for it. But you can create your own command just to do that with a couple of letters. Yeah, and then save that in your .bash rc file. So it's also really .bash. You can, uh, what about aliases? Uh, you can alias it in your .bash right. rc. But you can do it with Git too. Yes. Git has aliases, just like the bash uh, configuration has aliases. Where, like I mentioned a second ago, with the graphing command, you can say, "I want Git um, L to be this big long mother." It's pretty simple. Um, when I, every Stack Overflow question has instructions. I think there might be some in the book too, but we don't have any examples for right now. Yeah. Also, for those who use the wonderful text editor, which is Vim, there is a wonderful plugin called Vim Fugitive. It basically puts all of the power of Vim in your text editor. So you can do commits, merges, check out other branches, look through the history, all within your text editor. If you use Vim and you want to use Git, this is the way to do it. Now, another thing, um, there, I'm sure plenty of you have used it's like some degree of text editor with plugin support, like Sublime Text, maybe Vim, maybe Emacs. I'm sorry, maybe Emacs or something. 
but quite a few of them have what's called a git gutter plugin, where normally in the gutter of a text editor, there is a line of numbers to say where what the line numbers are. The gutter plugins usually add like little pluses um, or other symbols to indicate changes and removals for what you're currently working on. It's pretty neat. I might even describe it as nifty. Like for example, here would be an example of Vim Fugitive keeping our blame where it's relatively easy to see. If we were using a more sane text size, this would look a lot more pretty. But essentially, we can keep track of our edits and it inside of your text editor. Thank you, OSX. Um, keep track of all of that sort of stuff. Also, if you ever need to know what a command does, git help that command. Um, for example, if we want to know what merge does, git help merge. We wait a second for it to load the man page. And there's the command, what it does in all its glory. The help documentation is extensive. So it might be kind of slog to read through, but it's also very helpful. Yeah. Now we're almost there. Hang on for another couple of minutes or a couple slides. So, what about my lovely UI? Um, for those of you who don't want to go the way of the one true editor and use your um, terminal for everything, um, there are tools that have GUIs. Um, some of them are quite good. Um, GitHub has a wonderful desktop client that I've seen some people actually use and they there's, like yeah, it quite a bit. There's one version of the client for Mac, there's one for Windows, and there's nothing. Um, if you're using another one that I've run into is Meld. Um, Meld is fantastic. It's available in all of your favorite distros. It's primarily a diffing tool, though, isn't it? Um, it's primarily a diffing tool, but it does do other oh, okay. stuff, too. So it's really useful. Um, if you're using the latest version of Eclipse, there's a Git plugin for that, um, yeah, which gives you... understanding how it works. I don't. Yeah, it's kind of a pain. But... Um, also, you have Vim Diff, um, Vim Fugitive, both for the Vim crowd. And then for Emacs, there's Emerge, not to be confused with the Gen 2 um, package manager. For now, there's the also another one that we didn't include on this. I actually just found out about it a little while ago. It's called Source Tree. It's made, I think, by the same people who made Bitbucket. And I've heard that it's pretty nice. I haven't messed with it myself, but it's another pretty much complete Git system GUI for, I think, any platform. So that might be another thing to look into if you don't want to use the command line like a sane person. So to wrap it up, please, for the love of yourself and for the love of others, please use version control. Or right? Just be comfortable with it. Because it's a good thing. There's a, chance, there's a good chance that if you go to coding stuff in industry, you're going to be using version control of some sort. And it really just makes life a lot easier. Spend less time reverting and keeping track of your versions and more time coding. So we also promised you some wonderful resources. Um, we have links in this site which are, will be available. We'll send out an email with the location for where you can find these materials. Right. For those of you who are on the ACM members mailing list, congratulations. You're going to get a link. For those of you who are not and would like to be, it's a great thing to be on. Come and talk to myself or Robert, and we will arrange things for you. So we, we, we talked about ProGit. It's available online. It's a great book. Um, Atlassian, the people who make Big Bucket, have a wonderful set of tutorials. That's how I learned Git, um, labeled as Cheat Sheet right here. Um, there are also reference materials for it. Once knowing how to do different things, um, there are some workflows and how to do some things that you do a lot better in Git. And then also we have a link to Mercurial for those who, um, for whatever reason, don't like Git. It's another great distributed version control system. It's based on Python. So any questions, comments, concerns, limericks, puns, haikus, site faults? Um, 